Today we continue our series, which is entitled, I Grew Up in the Circus, and our guest today is Henry Berragan. Did Good. I pronounce that right? That's correct. Um, Thank you. Uh, like all of our guests in this series, uh, Henry was born into the world of circus. His uh, particular family tree branches uh, by reports five generations of circus performers on his mother's side and um, reportedly eight on his father's. Um, additionally, when I was trying to sort this all out, uh, those branches intertwine with the generations of, of branches from other great circus family trees. Um, when I was preparing to, to talk with Henry, I actually started making one of those charts like you see in those, in those three-part novels, historic novels of, of who's related to whom. But today we're gonna to talk to Henry about those families and those people, uh, but also about his 40 plus years um, in, the, in the world of circus behind the scenes. Um, not necessarily in the ring, but behind the scenes. So welcome. Thank you, Dwight. Thank you for having me here. I thank the Ringling uh, Museum for uh, hosting this today, and I thank everyone for being here. Well, we're gonna start on a, on a tour of, of your own family tree. Um, both, both parents, uh, circus performers. Um, let's start with, you, with your father's family. My, my father was Vicente Manuel Barragan. He did the cloud swing. Um, he is eight generations, well, my, I'm eight generations on the, my father's side. Um, I didn't really get to know my father's side of the family very well. Um, I, my mother and father divorced when I was seven, so I grew up with my mother. Um, cloud swing. He, you have to define, for those of us who don't know, what, it, what is a cloud swing? Cloud swing is an aerial act that is hung like a rope from point to point. And cloud swing, the longer the cloud swing is, the more difficult it is to perform on the cloud swing. And his was one of those very, very long cloud swings. Um, when he came to this country, he performed his cloud swing act on Daly Brothers Circus. Uh, he performed it on King Christiani Brothers Circus, which is where I was born. Um, and do you know, is, is that what the previous generations have no. done that type he, of act? Uh, no, he was, he was taught by a, a, uh, a master trainer in Mexico in the art of the cloud swing, is uh, basically that. I mean, there's a huge tradition of, of circus performance in Mexico. Uh, circus is, is, is very big. Um, Multi-generational families in Mexico um, come uh, do all sorts of uh, circus disciplines from flying trapeze to uh, single trapeze to juggling to the cloud swing like my father did to ground perch. Do you know are there any cousins from that family did, um, that continued I, in the circus tradition? I, I do. Well, from the Barragon side, um, I, I have cousins. They're the Bautista family. They do teeterboard. There's uh, relations to them. Circus is a little bit like um, a very insular community where uh, families uh, marry other families and continue the art form. So in that sense, yes, there's, there's many um, distant cousins and second cousins uh, that I have that are still performing. And then your, your mother's not from Mexico. She, her family originates Chile. From, from, from Santiago, Chile. Um, my, uh, the patriarch of, of, of the family was Marcos Droguet. He came over in the 50s, performed on many American circuses. Uh, they, they did a family uh, hat throwing act um, where the, 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 the hats were cone shaped and it was a very fast paced number and uh, was very, very successful, very well known. My father, uh, my, my grandfather came over with um, his wife, Rebecca, and she was from Mexico. They married in Mexico. And my mother, Eloisa del Carmen Droguet, my aunt, Juana uh, Droguet, and my uncle, Mauricio Droguet. Uh, there were two other siblings that remained in South America. George uh, stayed in, in Santiago, and Maria stayed, uh, lived in uh, Argentina. They married outside of the circus. Uh, and then your, your parents met in Mexico City, I believe they, you they, said? They, they met and married in Mexico. 
And then came to this country. And then came to this country. When they met and married in Mexico, um, they had two children, my older brother, Marcos Manuel Barragan uh, Zapata. He was also a clown, went to the Ringling Clown College, performed with Ringling Brothers for seven years, and then uh, toured with Circus Vargas and with Tihani. Um, he uh, contracted cancer um, at the early age of 29 and passed away at 30, but he was a very good clown, very excellent clown. But you actually were born on the road. It was the King Christiani Brothers Circus on tour. What city? Uh, York, Pennsylvania. If you take a look at the King Christiani itinerary, you'll see on May 23rd, uh, they played York, Pennsylvania, and that's when I was born. Actually, I was born prematurely. My father was driving the hippopotamus truck, had an accident. I ended up in, uh, my mother ended up in the hospital, and I was in the newspaper, television, and radio the day I was born. <laughs> I always say to our guests, you do realize that your lives are quite unlike um, other people's. I mean, there's not very many stories that start any story that starts with my father was driving the hippopotamus truck. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, that's exactly. Just, that's, exactly. That's, that's just that's an uh, that's an attention to detail that grabs your attention. Um, what are your? Do you have that first recollection of of being at the circus? That first childhood memory. Um, honestly, my first childhood memories were here in Sarasota when my parents first came to Sarasota, we stayed at the Circus City Trailer Park. And um, in the Circus City Trailer Park, there were the other circus kids. It's right there on, um, on Beneva near Fruitville. And uh, the kids would hang out, and, and the Ringling Winter Quarters was just nearby, and they had some storage barns and everything, so the kids would always just get together and play and have fun. And one day, we were in the back um, of the uh, Circus City Trailer Park, and the bunch of us, my cousins and, and some friends, we, we wanted to start a little, little campfire. So we're all trying to get it started, passing the matches around. And then um, I got it started. And before you knew it, we had a big fire going on. So all the kids like cockroaches went home. And the next thing you know, the fire department came and we all had red tails by the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of your, you know, your, your childhood friends were also. Yes. Um, Dorita as was here the other day, and she referred to, did you consider yourself a circus brat? Uh, yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I do also want to mention that um, I, I have two, two sisters, uh, both live in Tampa, and they, and they did not continue with the circus. Like I said, when I was seven years old, um, my mother and father divorced, and we moved to Tampa, and she wanted to get the children into a regular school to get a regular uh, formal education and um, so in the sense that I was born in the circus it's true I was born in the circus but I, I grew up and went to regular school in Tampa Florida um, so in my in my case instead of being born and staying with the circus I kind of left the circus and ran away with the circus to join it when I went back um, your father's career ended in an accident. Yes. Um, Were you present? No. Um, I was at Circus City Trailer Park at the time. My father was performing with the Ringling Brothers South American unit touring South America. And ironically, it was in Santiago, Chile, my mother's uh, home and, and, and city of birth. And he was performing. Um, he did two acts. He did the aerial uh, cloud swing and he did a hand balancing act. And in the hand balancing act, he did a finishing trick where he would do a handstand on his shoulders and actually walk around in the ring with that. Uh, quite an incredible feat by itself. Um, it was made out of wood and um, the wood broke and he took the fall and he got up and dusted himself off. But a couple of weeks later, he uh, ended up waking up paralyzed with half of his body being paralyzed. That is what ended his career and had an impact obviously on us children wanting to pursue or perform in the circus uh, going forward. Did you, um, in, in the time that you lived in Tampa though, did you continue to in, um, go to the circus? I mean, or did it just sort of remain that, that attractive memory or that distant memory? Well, when the circus would come to uh, Tampa, we would go see the circus because my grandfather at the time uh, was clowning. Um, after the, the, the family had act broke up, 
the children got married and moved on, he took to clowning. And um, he joined Ringling when it was actually in the tent. And then he also continued working with Ringling when it transitioned playing into arenas. And every time we would play Tampa, or this Ringling would play Tampa, we would get a chance to go see the show. And that's where we got the itch to go back. And that was your, your, your mother's father, that my mother's My mother's father, was a Marcos Droguet, yes. Um, so your brother, mm -hmm. uh, I, I believe he, he rejoined the circus first. Correct. He As a performer or? No, he actually started selling snow cones for Marty Cora, a famous concessionaire. <laughs> and uh, Marty Cora uh, took a liking to Zapata and they became lifelong friends as well as with me and his children as well. And he gave him a nickname, Zapata, because he couldn't remember Manuel. So <laughs> Zapata stuck, and that became his nickname, but also became his clown name. And he went to, to Clown College. He went to the second year of Ringling Brothers Clown College, got a contract to work with Ringling, toured with them for seven years, uh, performed um, with um, Circus Vargas in California, as well as Tijani in South America. And then you joined soon thereafter. Yes, um, I was in high school at the time and my mother decided I was a little bit too much of a handful. It was in the 60s and uh, she wanted some male guidance. So she sent me on the road uh, to join Ringling Brothers. I joined the Ringling Red Unit. Uh, Gunther Gable Williams was uh, the featured artist at the time. And uh, my brother became my mentor and my, my, uh, my guardian, if you will, at that time. Any desire to ever perform? Did you perform? I, uh, I had a cousin who was performing on that show, Sergio Ramos, he was doing Flying Trapeze, he did the triple at the time, and um, their contract ended either that year or the following year. And um, I, I, I got the, 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 the bug to perform and asked him if he would teach me how to catch in Flying Trapeze. And he took me on and he was teaching me to catch in the Flying Trapeze Act and we were touring with some, uh, another producer doing what we'll call, we call Paul K dates. There were his dates. Uh, he had, uh, I think, um, uh, Indianapolis and, and he had Hawaii. And um, another friend who was on the show, uh, Bill Strong, did a rocket trapeze act and a aerial cradle act, which is an aerial rigging that is uh, a fixed rigging guide out and you go up and you do fixed tricks or swinging tricks in the act. And um, he had booked his cradle act in Hawaii. And uh, as a result, um, he ended up also booking his rocket trapeze act in the mainland. What's rocket trapeze? It's, it's a uh, mechanical rigging that goes completely 360 degrees with a aerial rigging and it was a rocket that is, uh, it's a simulated rocket and you do trapeze uh, routines from that. Uh, while it goes around? While it's going around. It's quite a, an interesting and, and exciting act. It's, it's a, a much more, it's a much better paying act, of course, in terms of the two, the Cradle Act versus the Rocket Trapeze Act. So Bill Strong wanted to, uh, to stay with booking the Rocket Trapeze Act, asked me at that time if I would do the Cradle Act with his sister-in-law to, to go to Hawaii. And I thought, let me see, Hawaii. Cradle Act. <laughs> I'll do it. So that was the only time I did do it because by that time I had rationalized that the world that I had come from, and, and we'll go into that a little bit with Ringling Brothers and the Concessions, was the world I, I wanted to continue doing because a circus artist is an independent artist and they're responsible for their own health care. Uh, there's, there's whatever savings they have comes from the contracts that they get. And um, the concession division of Ringling Brothers, which is where I worked, um, I had an opportunity to continue and start a career path there. And there we had benefits and a paycheck and, and uh, other benefits that came along with the job that I opted that that was the direction I really wanted to go because it was a, a, a clear career path that I could take. Um, you spent over 20 years on and off with, with the Ringling Show. Um, Oh, Henry prepared a, a, you know, a bit of background information for us in preparation for this, and uh, something contained uh, in that, that document I, I found in talking to a lot of people in the circus. You, you mentioned your mentors, 
Um, and uh, maybe you'd like to share something uh, about these two men, Roland Kaiser okay. and Bobby Johnson. Well, Roland Kaiser was my very first boss in the circus business. When I joined Ringling Brothers Circus in 1973, he was the concession manager. He gave me the opportunity to go on the road and tour. He's, he's the man that said yes to me. Um, it, it is because of him that I'm here today. Um, he was uh, a good uh, leader, a good uh, guide. Uh, he took me in uh, like a son and treated me with much respect. Um, he went on with, in the circus business, uh, and he, he was also a circus artist when he first started. He came to Ringling Brothers with the Bocara Teeterboard Act, so his background was actually artist as well. When, um, when he went on to, to leave Ringling, he became the concession manager initially with Circus Vargas and ending up, ended up purchasing Circus Vargas and became a circus owner himself. Roland Kaiser still lives in Sarasota to this day with who I owe a lot of gratitude and re uh, respect for. Uh, Robert Johnson, Bobby Johnson became my, my second mentor, if you will, and really a true mentor. He was concession manager on the blue unit. So my first unit was on Ringling Brothers red unit with Gunther, then I went to the blue unit. Uh, those of us that are on Ringling, if we've been on red and blue unit, we call ourselves the purple people. <laughs> <laughs> and Bobby Johnson uh, gave me um, the training, the background, and the opportunities to grow within the concession division to where I ultimately made concession manager on the unit. And in the concession division, that was the highest position attainable at that point. Um, yeah, in, in looking at, uh, at, your, at your resume, I mean, you really, you went from starting in the organization, keeping bookkeeping, essentially, mm -hmm. um, up through working concessions. Um, and as I read that, I tried to, I tried to imagine the scale of, do, I mean, all of those things that swirl and twirl. It, was this food, too? The, the yes, food it's, it's food and beverage and, and merchandise. Um, this, the concession division of Ringling Brothers is a, is a big business. Um, obviously, when you're playing a 20,000-seat arena and you sell light-up toys or you sell programs or you sell popcorn or concession items, uh, there's, there's a, a large volume involved. So that comes with um, merchandising. It comes with uh, you know, product development, all the things that any retail environment would, would, would require. If there's a 20,000 seat house and all 20,000 seats are filled, what's the goal? I mean, to get 5,000 of them to buy something more or? Uh, the goal really honestly depends on the product that you're selling. It's no different than a retail store. Yeah. Uh, we measure the success of an item both by per capita, which is the revenue that it's uh, driving in based on the per head per person, and or the penetration rate. The penetration rate means one out of 10 people will buy an item, one out of 20 people will buy an item, and that is where we fell into the science of projecting our merchandise, because you can imagine what the logistics must be like shipping merchandise from a warehouse distribution center to Ringling Brothers Circus, playing thousands and thousands and thousands of people all throughout the season, all throughout Does the, the year. Does the merchandise- it's quite I a mean, job. I guess it follows the circus that doesn't come back to the warehouse between shows or? No, no. I used to do retail. I'm really interested in this because I, <laughs> when I go to the circus, I went to Circus Sarasota last week and they're walking around with the swords that light up and, and you know, I don't have children so I don't have to spend the money yet. I kind of want one of those to twirl around. <laughs> and so I just wonder, you know, how, how many takers do you have it? Well, at the on Ringling Brothers, and, and I cannot speak for today, but I'm sure it's pretty similar. Um, they had uh, two railroad cars, first started with one initially and then became two railroad cars that they gutted out and they racked out, uh, racking out meaning putting in shelves for the merchandise and storing the merchandise on two railroad cars as part of the train car setup. In addition to that, they, uh, the concession wagons uh, or the show wagons included concession wagons where we would store merchandise inside of it and we would also have offices uh, that we would operate out of for the souvenir stands and the food stands and the, uh, the, 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 the business part of the office as well. What are the most popular items? I mean, is most of the money made off of, uh, of food? food? Is it the food, program? Food, food is, is, is among the most popular because who doesn't want a cotton candy when you go to the circus? 
Um, popcorn is also a very good seller. Uh, uh, as far as merchandise, uh, lights are, are probably the most prominent item that are, are purchased. And, and there's a little history to that, um, and I'll share with you what my version or what I know of it. And when Ringling Brothers in the Tent Days would tour, they would come to Madison Square Garden and play the arena. So it would be in the tent and then go into the arena. And in the Madison Square Garden arena, they would sell what they called bantam lights. And it's just a little bitty flashlight on a plastic string. And they would twirl them. And the owners and, and the concessionaires of Ringling saw the whole arena light up with these little bantam lights. So they got the idea, well, maybe we could uh, replicate this and be successful with this item in other cities as well. So they contacted somebody in California, uh, his name was Woody Pierce, and he had what was called an astrolite. It's a, it's a round plastic disc with two rings uh, and a string, and you would pull it and it would spin and it would light up because of the centrifugal force. It was a centrifugal force mechanism that would, would make I had it light up. Those. Did you? <laughs> and then the, the next generation became um, a ringling produced item and that was a dome light, and it was like a dome on the police car. And that became the beginning of when Ringling Brothers started developing their own products. And to this day, if you go to Ringling, you'll see an array of custom specific merchandise that is all from that generation when it started. Well, you, you ran concessions, then you ran the warehouse, then you did national sales, director of sales, then worldwide concessions, so this stuff has to be shipped overseas as well? Correct. Uh, the worldwide portion I actually did um, equipment control and distribution. So whenever a show comes off the road, if it's a show that is intended on going back out, we would do a refurbishment. So I would take the show, and it was when it was in Venice, Florida, um, and we would revamp it and freshen it up, and then it was ready to go back out on the road. If it was a new production, then it would be a little bit more lengthy because everything had to be um, uh, graphically done based on the new theme of the show and, 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 and along with the, the type of merchandise that we would choose to sell. Did you ever come up with a, a product, a piece of merchandise that just fell flat like All several time. years later? You just had <laughs> boxes? All the time. It's like anything. Um, you try and you hope for a winner. It's just like producing a show. Yeah. You produce a show and you hope that it's a hit but we all know about Broadway and that sometimes there's a flop that comes along with it and merchandise is no different. I have to know, what was the biggest dog piece of merchandise? <laughs> um, the biggest dog, gosh, that would, how many? Um, one, of the, one of the items, oh, nothing. There's none that haunts you? like Nothing that really stands up because the, the product development uh, group yeah. were really pretty outstanding and, st and still are. But uh, there, there were a few that wouldn't make it, obviously. You know. So it, two truck or two train cars full. Mm -hmm. Is this stuff inventoried? Mm -hmm. Every setup and every. And the all? inventory. It's a perpetual inventory. We have a running inventory on each booth that's selling the merchandise, and we have a total combined inventory where we keep track of everything. Um, when I joined Ringling Brothers, everything was done pretty much manually. I think uh, the calculator that I used, I would push the buttons in and they would stay down until you hit the enter button. Uh, kind of <laughs> archaic considered today. Um, but yeah, the, uh, the um, what was, where were we going with this? Just the, a day in the life of setting this stuff up. Oh, oh and, the, and, the, and, but and the total combined inventory part of yeah. it. What I wanted to get to was, uh, it was all done by hand. Uh, as so many uh, other businesses in those days, um, we're going back 40 years, and then came the computer. So we switched over from manual inventory and manual control to a con uh, computer system. So it was a transition that facilitated maintaining inventory levels so that you could better keep track of the inventory. Um, besides uh, the Ringling Show, uh, there are some intriguing items on your resume. Um, you worked Six Flags for a while? I had the opportunity to work for Six Flags. Uh, the general manager was David Rosenwasser, a former Ringling promoter, and um, he contacted me about going to Six Flags and put in a, um, a um, 
food operation in front of uh, Six Flags. The projection, I think, at that time, and Six Flags had an indoor entertainment facility in the inner harbor of Baltimore called the Power Plant. And the Power Plant um, was the original power plant of Baltimore back in the day, and when it burned down, it was one of the few structures that remained. And Six Flags came in and did an indoor entertainment attraction that was unique, um, and the concept was great. The trouble they had was getting it to be successful like anything else. And what we wanted to do was put this food and beverage oper operation in front of the Six Flags power plant because studies had proven that there was more, more foot traffic in, 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 in the inner harbor than actually Disney World. So that was a big motivation. We had budgeted like $250,000 to put this whole operation with a beer garden and sandwich stations and outdoor type food. They decided against that and instead they ended up spending a million dollars in a basement walkthrough attraction and subsequently closed. So they could have made a million, that was a projection, but they spent a million. So that might have helped, not to guarantee that it was. And I also have a good friend, Bob Collins, who's here today uh, in attendance, who was part of that uh, power plant um, marketing group. Not only that, he also hails from Ringling Brothers as a marketing director or promoter um, and a very good friend of mine. I'm glad you're here, Bob. Thank you. Um, what, uh, what is the NFL experience? I mean, I know what the NFL is, but what is the, the NFL? The NFL experience is, is generally at each Super Bowl. The NFL experience um, is a interactive uh, uh, component of the Super Bowl activities. It's like two huge tents, each one almost the size of a football field. In it, they have a portion of the, um, the Hall of Fame. They have their sponsorships, uh, you know, walkthrough attractions, merchandise. It's, it's, it's a fun thing that people go do to see the, uh, when they're at the, at the uh, Super Bowl to do during the event. It's just one of the uh, staples that they've had for at least 10 or 15 years minimum that I can think of. And when um, Alan Bloom, who was mark uh, marketing, vice president of marketing for Feld Entertainment, left the Feld organization, he had taken on several different projects to do. And one of the projects was the NFL experience um, on tour and they would go into certain markets and emulate what is at the Super Bowl for the public to, to go enjoy outside of that timeline. So um, they contacted me to be the advanced person to go in and try to find places where that footprint would actually fit. So I would go and got my little measuring tape and we'd measure the, the whole area and see if we could put that in that location. And these were locations that were already contacted in advance and if it would work then we would bring it to this location and um, as, as luck would have it um, they, that didn't succeed either it, they, did <laughs> three, they did three markets and when when they set it up they had they did they did a hopscotch they would set up the two huge tents for the, Nash, uh, the NFL experience in one market then I would jump ahead to the next market and oversee the setup with another set of tents, same size, and do the, the perimeter fencing, the security, the office trailer, the whole setup that would be needed so that the show could, or the NFL Experience group could come in and set up right away, and then they would go back, take down the next one, and go to the next one. One of the things, uh, when I first came to the Ringling, that I, I found very interesting, and then it, it stood to reason, that John Ringling's good friends would be people like Sam Gompertz, who owned Coney Island, mm -hmm. or Charles Thompson, who owned the, the, the Wild, Buff help me, Debbie, the Buffalo Bills show. Yes, um, and it, it's, it's the same now, isn't it? All of these large-scale, outdoor, family spectacle kinds, it's, it's one huge, huge industry that, um, that you've been a part of for there's, 40 years. There's certainly crossover. Um, I'm not the only one that can attest to that. There's been people that have worked for the Feld organization, for Ringling Brothers, for Circus, or concessions, and have crossed over uh, certain uh, aspects of what they do into other venues, such as the NFL experience on tour that I was able to uh, get that job 
by uh, the contacts that I had and, and the background of work that I do. Similarly, the Six Flags power plant was my concession background that brought me in, not exclusive to circus. Um, has Sarasota County remained home through all of these years or? Pretty much uh, Sarasota, actually Venice. I, I live in Venice with my partner Virginia, who's also here today somewhere. Um, yes, it's, it's been home. Um, I've, I've used this as a base and um, I love it here. Uh, I'm, I've been able to expand my, my circus uh, family, contacts, friends by, by being here, by living here, including the current position that I hold which is Operations and Logistics Director for Circus Arts Conservatory. We just completed a very successful run at the UTC Mall. Some of you may have seen it. <laughs> Red, White, and Bellow. Um, let's talk a little bit about some of those related circus families because sure. um, uh, one of the first uh, documents that I got from, uh, from our circus, my, my circus colleagues, um, was a, a piece that uh, Henry had prepared, a, a background on the Del Morrell, am I pronouncing? Mm -hmm. The Del Morrell family, and um, fascinating story of, the, of this, this family and their act, but I kept going through it and I couldn't find Henry anywhere in that, that family tree, but it was your the, mother's sister? Correct. The, the Del Morrell uh, troop uh, did a ground perch, a three-person troop act, and they are currently, um, uh, in, in the Ring of Fame recognition um, that were dedicated two years ago. Um, my uncle, George Del Morale, married my aunt, Juana Droguet. And there, the, the, the connection lies with did my- Did your mother continue to perform? I mean, obviously her sister performed, but did your mother continue My mother performed as a showgirl, um, performing in some of the production numbers, but she never performed the family uh, hat-throwing act or um, any kind of a solo type of an act. She really relegated her dedication and her life to raising the children. And then by extension, in the Del Morrell family, there I, I, a young man's name popped out who had performed here a couple of uh, years ago at the Summer Circus Spectacular, Christian Stoinev, yes. who at the same time was keeping us in suspense because he was on um, mm. America, America's Got Talent, America's right? Got Talent, correct. It did very well, I yes. think. Um, yes, and, and, and Christian's mother is, um, is part of the um, Ataide family of Mexico. And uh, uh, she is also related to the Del Moral. So the, the web of, of connections, six degrees of separation, if you will, in one sense, is that um, I'm connected to Christian by um, his mother, the connection with the Taides, the connection with the Del Morales, and many other circus families as, as well. Circus people always speak highly of each other and of their mentors, but I realize now it's because you're all related. You, you <laughs> <laughs> it's called promotion. It's called promotion. <laughs> um, a couple of other uh, circus names, the Vasquez family? Yes, um, my cousin Juliana Droguet and my cousin Mario Droguet are mar married a brother and a sister. So Mario is married to uh, Sarah Vasquez, the sister of Miguel Vasquez, who com made the uh, quadruple somersault in, in the history books of circus. And um, Juliana is married to Fel Felipe Vasquez, who is, his, who is Miguel's brother as well and completed the triple somersault in, in the Flying Vasquez Act. Um, then there's some Irish got into the family here. The, is it Fawcett? The, the Fawcetts. Um, this goes to the Del Moral family. Um, Eddie Del Moral um, married, actually, yes, he married uh, Cherry Fawcett, who is an Irish circus family. Together they had a son, Lorenzo, and unfortunately they did divorce, and Eddie remarried and Eddie is currently married to Tina Gable of uh, the Gable family, Gunther Gable's daughter, and they have a son, uh, Marcos, who was named after, in my opinion, my brother, because my brother was Marcos Manuel Barragan, and their son is Marcos Manuel Del Moral, Gable. So pretty much anywhere you go in the world, you don't have to buy tickets to the circus. Uh, you don't. <laughs> um, 
you're now, as, as you, you said, with the Circus Arts Conservatory, and, and uh, you helped Dolly and Pedro in the early years of that organization. In, in, in the very beginning, uh, it was a fledgling uh, start-up organization, and the, the vision was to create the National Circus School of Performing Arts. And to support this uh, vision, because which one starts first, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, the chicken or the egg, if you will, uh, it was decided to produce Circus, the first edition of Circus Sarasota. And in those years, it was quite a struggle. Um, I contributed over time, over the years, in different capacities. At that time, initially, I was box office manager, media buyer, um, and I helped at the very beginning put up the tent. I think uh, the first year there was three of us that were there to take it down. It was quite an <laughs> undertaking and uh, no equipment really to speak of, so it was, it was very difficult. But over time, um, Circus Sarasota made its mark, uh, became um, a mainstay in Sarasota, um, is very well known, um, and had, its own, uh, ha had established its own credibility. The mission then, um, as it is today, was to enhance the circus arts in this community uh, because back in, 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 in the early uh, 60s, 70s, 80s, the, uh, the circus um, reputation had started being less and less a focal point in the community and including the museum until the university took it over, the funding for the museum had deteriorated. So their mission, uh, and, and as I said, including today, is to enhance the circus arts in this community, the perception of the circus arts, and bring it to the level of the ballet, the orchestra, with the same respectability. And those of you that have seen Circus Sarasota uh, can certainly agree that it, it's, it's a dedication and a lot of hard work that has helped that perception. In addition to that, um, in 2012, uh, we were given, when I say we, the Circus Arts Conservatory, were given the big responsibility of taking over the s then 65-year-old program of Sailor Circus. So today, um, which is the future of circus, the youth, as we all know, uh, we are responsible for the Sailor Circus Academy. We have also outreach programs, the humor therapy program, where we go into senior centers, hospitals, emergency locations, and bring that Patch Adams style um, humor and, 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 and hope to people that, that really don't get it. And we also have a big top education, which we go into area schools, and I'm not as well rehearsed in this because I'm not involved in that, but they go in and they bring curriculum um, of what the circus arts are, how they translate into science and math, um, and, and they do quite a job, and those are really um, the, the, the true jewels. Uh, while we perform at the highest level and bring you every year in the month of February the best we can bring you, the true jewels are the good work that we do throughout the year with Circus Arts Conservatory. And the one thing that I do want to uh, mention is our co-founder, it's, it's Pedro Reis and Dolly Jacobs. Dolly Jacobs received the, uh, the, uh, the NEA Award for Folk uh, uh, Fellowship uh, last year, which is a huge recognition for anybody in the folk arts from the Smithsonian Institute, and she is the first person to receive this. It's quite an accomplishment. Um, we're all quite proud of her and what she's been able to do in the circus world, but it goes without saying. And then one of the programs, I'll make a pitch for, for what you do with us. Um, yes, thank uh, you. It's, it's been really fun, um, and this year will be the 10th year that we present circus in this space. Um, for seven weeks now, we run uh, a show here called Summer Circus Spectacular, and it, it really is, I think, a wonderful moment, I, I believe, for the performers to perform in a space like this where there's such a focus on, on their artistry, and it's really revealed in a setting that uh, is a testament to what an incredible performing artist they actually are. Um, you spoke of Sailor Circus as the future of the circus. Uh, you've been involved in the circus since day one. You made news the day you were born. Um, what are your thoughts on the future of the circus in America? Well, I think circus in America and circus worldwide is reinventing itself. Uh, 
for some obvious reasons. We all know what the um, animal rights movement has done taking uh, animals um, out of circus, in, including some countries. Mexico today does not have any wild animals in their circus at all. Um, circus Sarasota has never presented wild or exotic animals, although we have presented